Hello and welcome to American Pro Probation and Pro Association's webinar, Police Probation and Pro Partnerships, Enhancing Reentry Accountability and the Need for Formalized Partnerships. My name is Adam Matz. I am a research associate with APPA. Presenting with me today is Dr. Bitna Kim, Assistant Professor at the Department of Criminology of Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kim has published extensively on police probation and parole partnerships in journals such as Police Quarterly and the Journal of Criminal Justice. Also presenting with us today is Mr. Tom Williams, Associate Director of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, also known as CSOSA. He has been with CSOSA since 2000 and will be discussing their accountability tours and enhanced supervision partnership. The presentation is expected to last 60 minutes with 30 minutes remaining for questions. We encourage you to post questions in the chat during the presentation. At the end, we will try to answer as many of the, these questions as possible. There's also a brief survey at the conclusion of the broadcast. Please complete the survey and feel free to make any additional comments. Your feedback will aid us in improving future broadcasts and trainings. Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be made available through the APPA website and APPA's PSN dedicated website in the near future. Contact information will be provided at the end if you would like to follow up with the presenters or obtain a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Finally, we want to thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Department of Justice for the support of this training through the Project Safe Neighborhoods Anti-Gun and Anti-Gang Initiative. Formed in 2001, PSN is a nationwide initiative aimed at the reduction of gun and gang violence. Heavily influenced by programs such as CompStat, Operation Ceasefire, and Exile. Administered by the 94 U.S. District Attorney's Offices, APPA is one of many partners who are authorized to provide PSN training to local jurisdictions. Training and technical assistance is available for agencies interested in PSN. Feel free to contact myself uh, at the end of the presentation if you're interested in learning more about that. Today's webinar specifically concerns partnerships between law enforcement and probation or parole agencies. One of the primary components of PSN is the promotion of collaborations and partnerships. This presentation is designed to further promote collaboration between police and community supervision agencies. The objectives of this webinar include outlining the history of police probation pro partnerships, distinguishing partnership types and objectives, summarizing the empirical literature on partnerships, identifying the benefits potential problems associated with partnership, and demonstrating the importance of formalized partnerships. The impetus for partnership is ultimately related to high recidivism, or the revolving door, as it is sometimes called. It's not uncommon for law enforcement to know offenders by name on the street. In an evaluation of Boston's Operation Ceasefire, researchers found a small number of youth were responsible for a large disproportionate amount of violent crime. Specifically, 1% of youth, often gang affiliated, were responsible for up to 60% of all youth homicides. Up to 50% of these offenders, and many victims as well, were under probation or parole supervision at the time of the crime. This characteristic is found in other cities as well. In a study of homicide in Lowell, Massachusetts, it was found that 44% of offenders and 18% of victims were under probation supervision at the time of the crime. Similar trends can be found in other large cities such as Chicago. If a large majority of these offenders are under community supervision and well documented, the fact that their crimes are able to be committed without intervention speaks to a gap in the criminal justice system to detect and intervene accordingly. Boston's Operation Nightlight, a component of Operation Ceasefire, 
is often regarded as the first formalized partnership. On November 12, 1992, two probation officers named Stewart and Skinner got in the back seat of a police car with two police officers, Myrner and Fortilia, to perform the first of many joint patrols. Stewart later went on record saying, quote, We never used to leave the office or talk to police, but in the early 1990s, the probation office looked like a mass unit, and we were seeing these police officers in the courthouse all the time. And we realized we were all dealing with the same kids. And one day they said, do you want to ride together? End quote. The basic regimen of the partnership consists of probation officers selecting 10 to 15 of their most high-risk youth, typically between the ages of 17 and 25, and also gang-affiliated. The plainclothes police and probation officers used unmarked cruisers while visiting each probationer at their home, school, or workplace while also driving through hotspot locations known for criminal behavior and youthful congregation. Unlike normal citizens, probationers do not possess the same rights to privacy and probation. Uh, officers have the unrestricted right to search for contraband and visit the clients at any time. While conducting these visits and checking probationary compliance, officers would also discuss substance abuse treatment and other social service options with youth and their families when applicable. As also adjusted, the officers also adjusted their normal business hours to accommodate the different times in which uh, crimes typically took place, which is usually later in the evening. As a result of this, it was believed that this late night sort of presence would add a additional uh, accountability to youth. And by having police involved, it also became uh, an opportunity for more information sharing. Police were able to add a sense of authority to the probation officers, but also serve as additional eyes to the probation officers on the street. One reason for law enforcement's willingness to get involved in interagency collaborations is associated with the shift to a community policing or problem-oriented policing ideology over the past few decades. A common criticism of law enforcement and the justice system in general had been its predisposition to be reactive. The political pressure to improve police practice and respond to crime more proactively has motivated law enforcement agencies to rethink how they've done business. As a result, the historically paramilitaristic approach has given way to a modern approach aimed at including the community and related agencies in the crime problem solving process. That said, the permutation of this ideology is not spread evenly across the U.S. Uh, many law enforcement agencies continue to operate still under more of a classical system. The advent of Homeland Security, on the other hand, may serve to kind of minimize the uh, the community policing efforts, uh, and particularly in terms of the on-the-ground police probation parole partnerships. While concerns of international security will likely lead to improvements in automated data, data sharing across justice agencies, it's, it's less likely to have um, support for local on-the-ground partnerships in terms of joint patrols and working together face-to-face. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Mr. Williams, and he will begin talking about partnership types and uh, enhanced supervision and accountability tours. Thank you.
And sorry, this seems to be a little bit of a, a technical issue. Uh, Tom, there should be a pen. If you're using a phone, you might have to type in a pen to get your audio working. It should be working now. Uh, yep. This is Tom Williams from CSOSA. Uh, as Adam mentioned, with the advent of community policing in the late 90s, uh, there have been more uh, federal dollars going to local police jurisdictions to have an increased uh, presence uh, of law enforcement uh, in the communities. Uh, and as a result of this increased uh, presence of law enforcement in the communities, law enforcement has uh, teamed up with local pro probation divisions uh, for the whole effort of uh, advancing the concept of uh, ensuring that from the public standpoint that there was a concerted effort towards a partnership with uh, local parole and probation and uh, policing agencies uh, around crime issues. Uh, this enhanced supervision effort uh, certainly has helped uh, to increase the public's awareness uh, that law enforcement and parole and probation agencies uh, were working together. Uh, and these joint patrols, uh, if you will, have also um, been uh, effective in letting the offender population know that uh, law enforcement and probation uh, is certainly working together. Uh, many efforts have been uh, directed towards uh, fugitive apprehension, uh, that is if there's parole and probation cases for which there's warrant activity either on the parole side or the probation side, then uh, law enforcement and probation have worked together in terms of uh, targeting those folks particularly those with weapons and violent offenses uh, in trying to serve uh, these warrants uh, early in the morning, uh, on Saturdays, and also late in the afternoon. Uh, there have been several fusion units that have been set up across the country. Uh, the Washington Baltimore Haida is one example, uh, as well as local law enforcement uh, fusion uh, efforts where law enforcement uh, and parole and probation are together with a staff person from parole and probation. So if there's uh, a crime issue that has arisen or that rises in the community, uh, then the parole probation officer or agent is right on staff in those fusion units and can give information to law enforcement uh, about a person who may be on either parole status uh, or probation status uh, and then how things are progressing with that individual. And if there's uh, a person under supervision who becomes known to uh, law enforcement, particularly as a suspect in the crime, then the probation officer who's in the fusion unit can give information to law enforcement that could help uh, solve the crimes. Uh, in Washington, D.C., as many as, as well as in other jurisdictions, where we have folks who may be under a GPS surveillance, uh, that is a tool uh, that is used extensively uh, across the country uh, to track individuals, and it can uh, help law enforcement uh, with regards to making cases to see if a person was in a particular area of a crime. But by the same token, it can also help uh, those under supervision by eliminating them uh, from, from suspicion uh, or for investigations uh, of crime. So from the largest standpoint of uh, the partnerships that have been uh, initiated, particularly with the nightlight uh, operation in uh, Boston, uh, many agencies have uh, continued in the effort of working closely uh, with law enforcement on several of their uh, initiatives and uh, building a partnership uh, with law enforcement. For example, here in CSOSA, just to give you a little bit of background information about the agency, uh, we became a federal agency uh, in August of 2000 under Janet Reno when she was the Attorney General. Uh, we supervised approximately 15,000 offenders under supervision, uh, approximately 65% of them are on probation. Uh, and 35% are on parole, supervised release, or mandatory release. We have about 10,000 offenders who enter our system each year. And uh, because we are a federal system uh, out of the Superior Court from the District of Columbia, uh, defenders who are sentenced to a term of incarceration uh, are sentenced to a Bureau of Prison uh, facility versus a state uh, facility. And about 2,500 of those offenders return uh, each year. About 83% of our population is male, uh, and at assessment, uh, approximately 40% of those persons that we have under supervision are at a high risk level. 
we started our accountability tours uh, with law enforcement uh, back in the late 90s, 1998, uh, and that uh, initiated with an MOU uh, with the Metropolitan Police Department. We expanded our um, accountability tours uh, in about 2004 uh, with the DC Housing Police. And our accountability tours include uh, joint home contacts uh, with law enforcement, uh, and these are face-to-face -face contacts that we have with the offenders in their homes. Uh, these contacts are, are scheduled contacts. Uh, MPD is um, certainly with us when we uh, go out, but they're in uniform, and certainly uh, when we go out, we have uh, either our protective vests on with the CSOSA insignia on it, and or uh, our jackets with CSOSA on the rear and also on the sleeve, and that way we're uh, readily identified in the community. Uh, weekly, we have uh, meetings with the commanders of each of the seven districts in uh, the District of Columbia, and we have our information sharing activities that happen uh, during those weekly meetings, meetings with the commanders uh, and their, their respective staff. We then share with them uh, those persons who were just granted parole or probation that, that are assessed at the highest risk level of intensive uh, and maximum supervision. Uh, and then we then schedule uh, to a, conduct our accountability tours uh, with uh, Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, our policy is that within the first 90 days uh, that the person is granted release uh, to supervision to us, we then schedule the tours uh, with the commanders, uh, the accountability tours. Um, the CSO certainly uh, goes into the home and take charge. MPD is with us, uh, but we don't have special search conditions. However, not that, that is we don't have special search conditions on all cases. Um, but if law enforcement does see something in play, plain view, uh, then they can take charge of the situation, and then we as the officers would then uh, be in the background. In 2012, which is fiscal year 2012, uh, we conducted something like 3,300 uh, accountability tours on uh, 2,300 offenders who were assessed as being high risk uh, to commit offenses or reoffenses within the community. Um, during the summer months, we also conduct uh, special accountability tours in collaboration with the Metropolitan Police Department uh, during the Crummer Sim uh, Crummer Summer Crime Initiative. Uh, during that Crummer Sime Initiative activity, we generally have a call in of uh, the high risk offenders in certain designated areas of the District of Columbia that are we uh, designate with, uh, with MPD as being high crime areas. Uh, they could be there uh, areas where high incidence of burglaries or weapon activity is, is happening in the communities. And um, we jointly have those uh, special accountability tours uh, Friday evening um, between uh, 5 and uh, 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening, and also on Saturday mornings uh, between 8 uh, and 12. Uh, once the tours are completed, then the staff are required to put the information into uh, our information system so that the officer, when he comes to work uh, that Monday, can see the results of uh, the special accountability tours. We normally uh, also have uh, special accountability tours on, on an ad need basis uh, if, uh, in conjunction with our law enforcement partners, there's a particular issue uh, that the law enforcement needs to increase presence uh, in the community, and on those special initiatives we do like a special accountability tours with law enforcement. Uh, for an example, uh, we may do special uh, accountability tours with law enforcement for sex offenders, uh, and we do that on a random basis, and we normally do uh, the special accountability tours with sex offenders on a Saturday, what I like to call the cartoon hours, when kids are home watching cartoons. Uh, we have certain offenders who are under supervision uh, for which they're not supposed to be around children, uh, and then we will go to the home uh, just to make sure that they're not uh, in that type of a situation that would jeopardize their release uh, and in violation of probation. The information sharing uh, that normally goes on within accountability tours uh, has a very uh, positive uh, influence with regards to uh, the MPD officer uh, because they get to know who has recently moved into the community, who have come back from prison, uh, who was granted uh, release from the courts. 
So the beat officer knows uh, basically who's in uh, the community. Uh, we also, as a result of these uh, accountability tours, are able to uh, have the MPD officers establish a positive relationship with the family members. Uh, this could help MPD uh, in the future, uh, Metropolitan Police Department, uh, in uh, gaining intelligence on a particular uh, crime issue in the area or a particular individual uh, in the area who uh, may be causing problems in the area. Uh, and by the officer knowing the family, uh, they may be more inclined to share information uh, about a particular crime or a particular individual that could help uh, reduce uh, a future occurrence of crime uh, in the community. Uh, when we're out with law enforcement in um, our, our jackets as well as our protective vests, it's a visible uh, presence with law enforcement uh, in the community. Uh, so the community will see us uh, there with law enforcement and know uh, that certainly we are working together. But as, as, as was mentioned previously with the Operation Nightlight, not like that actually uh, started the, the partnerships, uh, there have been several jurisdictions that have had uh, similar issues with regards to the partnerships between law enforcement uh, and parole and probation agencies. Uh, for example, the Minnesota Anti-Violence uh, Initiative uh, was started in Hennepin County uh, Minnesota, where probation officers uh, and law enforcement uh, work collaboratively together uh, to target specific uh, crimes and crime patterns uh, uh, in that county. Uh, there's also the partnership with uh, the local uh, law enforcement as well as federal officials uh, in the county uh, and adult and juvenile officers work in collaboration with the law enforcement entities. Uh, the, the purpose uh, of this uh, initiative was to target uh, areas that were hardest hit by crime uh, and then try to have an impact on crime reduction uh, in those areas. Uh, and the initiative involved uh, home verifications, for example. Uh, it also involved um, persons adjudicated with weapons offenses uh, who were targeted for this initiative. And it was also an effort for the officers to do uh, verification of employment and uh, there were special uh, initiatives with regards to warrant service. Uh, the juvenile intensive uh, supervision team uh, in Kentucky uh, was an effort of the uh, juvenile agency, juvenile officers to team up with local law enforcement to target um, uh, those offenders who or juvenile uh, persons who were actually at high risk uh, to continue uh, their activity, the criminal activity, as a way to try to suppress uh, that activity. So the juvenile intensive supervision teams allowed the juvenile worker to collaborate uh, with uh, local law enforcement. Uh, again, one of the efforts was uh, aimed at uh, home contacts, uh, curfews, uh, also contacts at schools uh, and at work, uh, just to ensure that uh, the juvenile was actually uh, actualizing a plan that was actually set out from, for him or her, uh, just a way to try to keep them uh, on target. Another positive aspect of the uh, juvenile intensive supervision team was for the law enforcement and the juvenile officers to uh, engage the family uh, in a follow-up of those items um, that was placed out as planned items for the juvenile, uh, just to make sure that they were certainly on target uh, to maintain the plan. Uh, another example of uh, partnerships uh, between law enforcement and uh, the juvenile agency was the Youth Violence Reduction uh, Partnership in Philadelphia, uh, which target uh, offenders in the 14 to 24 age grades who were uh, greatest risk to commit homicide, homicides or being killed. Uh, these persons were generally gang involved. Um, and. Uh, with regards to the assessment, they were uh, at the highest risk level uh, on the caseloads uh, of the juvenile officer. Uh, the juvenile offenders also, as a criteria, may have had a history uh, of incarceration. So these were persons who were high risk within the caseloads of the officers uh, who um, either were known to carry weapons or had an association with weapons. Uh, and the potential was very high for that individual to be uh, killed or harmed with regards to gunplay, uh, or also as a result of their involvement with the criminal element uh, to be killed. So it was a way to try to 
put uh, attendant services around that person with regards to what service needs were there and then attend to those uh, by the same token um, having a high surveillance mode uh, just to try to keep that person out of uh, criminal activity. Um, so those are just a few of uh, the examples of uh, enhanced supervision. Uh, the Texas uh, Project Spotlight is another uh, example in the early 90s. Uh, this project was uh, funded by uh, the government of, of Texas. Uh, several others were actually funded by the uh, feds that, that seed money to get started. But in this Project Spotlight, one of the key things uh, that was important for, our, for the uh, legislature was to target several um, counties within uh, Texas, uh, Dallas, for example, El Paso, Harris, Nusas, and uh, Tarrant County, as well as Travis. Uh, so it was targeting uh, seven heavily populated uh, counties. Uh, and these were three member teams that included the juvenile officer, uh, the adult uh, probation officer, uh, as well as law enforcement. So there was a, co a combined effort to see who's on the caseload, what associations there are, uh, and then target uh, violent offenders to see uh, what we could do to try to uh, maintain behavior within the confines of the law. Uh, and these activities uh, were conducted uh, either during the evening or uh, early morning hours, as well as weekends, um, making uh, special uh, contact with those persons, uh, either in the home or, uh, excuse me, uh, in their place of employment. Uh, again, the focus is uh, law enforcement and the probation entity uh, working closely together so that we can then identify uh, what are the attendant issues uh, that may um, come up in uh, the area of supervision uh, for which uh, there could be possibly criminal activity or another person or victim being uh, injured as opposed with regards to the activity of uh, the person's under supervision. Now with all the efforts, whether the, uh, CSOSA or whether the, some of the jurisdictions that I had mentioned, um, executive buy-in uh, is fundamentally important uh, as well as funding. When um, we uh, look at uh, the high prevalence of these activities uh, and how we think uh, they're important uh, with regards to our single mission of, of uh, crime prevention, uh, certainly we need uh, the chief of, of police of the jurisdiction uh, to be on board with this. And the examples that I just gave, uh, the chiefs uh, in those jurisdictions were uh, extremely important uh, in terms of getting these things off the ground. Uh, also we need uh, from the top up and then and down, we also need the chief probation officer or state and probation directors uh, to also um, be one who can forward the concept uh, you know, to the staff uh, and how this concept is important uh, to the mission of the agency and also to the public. Uh, and then without the buy-in of the chief executive officers, uh, then it makes it very difficult for uh, line officers to uh, you know, carry on uh, the mission of the organization and also to have uh, input uh, until into the practices uh, and policies uh, that can help further uh, the effort with uh, the joint partnerships. Uh, certainly uh, funding is important. Um, all funding from the federal government is important as opposed to seed money to, to get things started. Uh, and then hopefully um, as in other jurisdictions, uh, once we can demonstrate success uh, with the effort, then the, the state legislature uh, is more than willing to then come in uh, based on funding availability within the state uh, to help uh, support it. Uh, in other areas, uh, if it's, it's the state legislature uh, or the body is not, uh, because of fiscal issues, are not able to do it, then the chief executive officer of uh, the state preservation agency may be able to um, prioritize or reprioritize uh, you know, funding within the organization uh, to try to keep uh, the effort going. With regards to the activities that are happening on the weekends, and certainly overtime pay becomes important, uh, not only for um, uh, law enforcement, but also for the state probation agency as, as well. 
uh, we have an initiative with our cross, what we call our cross borders uh, initiative, working with the state of Maryland uh, in conducting uh, joint accountability tours for those persons who are under uh, interstate supervision uh, but can't be transferred to the state of Maryland or vice versa uh, to the district from Maryland. But we identify who these individuals are, uh, and then we make contact uh, with local law enforcement uh, as a method of trying to verify the home. Uh, one of the things that we found out with our cross-border initiative, uh, particularly for the non-transferable cases, um, we do unfortunately receive uh, addresses uh, for which the person claims they live there, uh, and then when we go make the contact uh, with local law enforcement, we find out that the person does not live at that address. So it might be a friend, it might be a relative's address that they gave us, but it certainly is not theirs. Once we have that information, then we bring it back to our uh, releasing authority um, after we've made several attempts to try to locate that person and to try to bring them back into uh, compliance. Uh, our Project Safe Neighborhood, uh, we had uh, several years ago here in the district uh, where we had a series of call-ins. Uh, and then again, that whole effort is to, how do we identify uh, persons who we know are going to commit, uh, who we suspect, I should say, commit uh, the types of offenses for which that will lead them back into difficulty. But we can put a very strong message to them uh, that if they don't want to change their ways, uh, then the arm um, of uh, the assistant U.S. attorney with regards to future prosecution uh, the weight of that office will come down on them, and particularly if they have uh, weapons offenses, uh, weapons possessions, which uh, felons certainly are not uh, supposed to have uh, weapon offenses at all. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that, that has come up in our effort with regards to the joint accountability tours uh, has been those with regards to uh, search conditions. Uh, it's very easy sometimes for uh, the public to think, well, since law enforcement is going into the home, uh, that they have uh, free reign to go and search uh, the individual's home, um, but that is certainly not the case. Uh, there has to be uh, release conditions that will permit um, uh, an individual to be uh, searched. Uh, otherwise, we get into violations of a person's uh, Fourth Amendment rights. But there are also several benefits, uh, and if I can just spend a few minutes to talk about the pros and cons, of the partnerships uh, with law enforcement. Uh, and part of the, the pros for uh, the partnerships uh, has one of, one of which is additional protection for probation and parole officers um, who may be going out or will be going out with law enforcement uh, in certain areas where, quote unquote, one could consider to be you know, highly dangerous. Uh, with regards to a high level of crime, with having the contacts with law enforcement does give uh, additional efforts with regards to protection. Um, if there is a particular search condition uh, on the order, uh, then certainly the law enforcement is certainly more experienced than some parole and probation officers with regards to those search condition. Uh, as in CSOSA, uh, we don't have uh, police powers and our officers don't carry weapons. Uh, but with certain cases, we do have searching conditions, for example, with regards to sex offenders, what are not supposed to have particular contraband in their homes. Um, so we may uh, assist, uh, have uh, the law enforcement assist us uh, in searching uh, specific if there's a condition uh, on a release order. Uh, the police has um, uh, increased technology within their vehicles. Uh, one of the things that we do in CSOS is we try to understand from the law enforcement standpoint how to use the radio, uh, if there's anything that happens, uh, to be in communication um, with uh, certainly our office, but also how do we use that radio to communicate with uh, the dispatcher, for example. Uh, from the public standpoint, uh, a greater street presence of law enforcement and the partnership that we have, law enforcement and probation agencies, uh, working together, uh, give them an increased sense of um, that there is a, a, a real sense from the public that we are certainly working together uh, and that there are issues, uh, if they do arise, uh, certainly the public can reach out either to uh, either the parole probation agency uh, or the law enforcement agency. Uh, and there's the information sharing uh, with law enforcement is certainly valuable. Uh, as I mentioned before, 
uh, to know who's in the community, who recently came back from parole, um, what sort of things that the person uh, may have done with regards to the criminal history. Um, but um, the Privacy Act protected information cannot be shared with law enforcement. So if a person has a mental health condition or if he's in a substance abusing program, uh, that, act, that activity is actually um, cannot be shared with law enforcement and actually is kept uh, confidential. Uh, one of the things that has helped us in the partnership with regards to our warrant service, uh, since we do have a relationship with law enforcement uh, and the, it's a very positive working relationship, if we do have to get um, uh, a warrant or request a warrant from a releasing authority uh, and then that warrant is issued, it's very easy now for us to pick up the phone, call our law enforcement partner, uh, let them know that the warrant uh, has been issued, uh, and there's a quick service uh, on the warrant. Uh, itself. Uh, part of some of the, the negatives like, are things that certainly um, give some rise is quote unquote the stalking horse incident, incidents rather and, and these are, um, there was a case U.S. versus Knight as I recall was a California case uh, for which there was a special condition uh, that was actually placed on a probation offender uh, for searches uh, within his home and also his cars and uh, also his person. And as a result of uh, uh, a crime that was committed with the gas company, uh, they, this gentleman was a high suspect uh, in this crime. And because it was under investigation, uh, the detective who actually investigated uh, this crime uh, also used, because he was aware of the special condition in the probation order, uh, went and searched the person's home without a, um, a search uh, warrant. Uh, it did go to the Supreme Court, uh, and it was upheld that uh, the officer actually could go and then uh, search his home, uh, even though it was under an investigation not specific to uh, the parole and probation order itself. So we have to be careful when we, when we do have the relationship with law enforcement. Uh, since there are specials, a person may have a special search condition, um, uh, and in those cases for which there isn't a special search condition, uh, law enforcement really is restricted from uh, going in and conducting the search uh, because it certainly will have a Fourth Amendment challenge uh, for which we may not prevail. Uh, but we also have, could have increased monitoring as a negative in terms of the problems associated with our partnerships. And with those increased monitoring, one of the things that we may be uh, doing is kind of racking up our violations very quickly uh, for which uh, the person would not be uh, under supervision because we would then get the warrant to take them off the street. And another negative aspect of the partnership could be turf issues that actually come up between law enforcement and um, the probation agency. And we certainly have to be careful about uh, mission distortion uh, or mission creep. So um, overall, uh, if we kind of harken back to when Operation Nightlight came into being and the number of uh, entities that have uh, continued the partnership um, you know, since that time, uh, overall it has been a very good working relationship uh, with law enforcement, uh, one by having our staff or probation staff in fusion units, uh, the relationships that we have with law enforcement. Uh, in making joint uh, accountability tours uh, with uh, you know law enforcement, and it also has given uh, to police uh, greater access to information um, about offenders who are under supervision, uh, who may be at the high criminality end of the spectrum, uh, and uh, are also engaged uh, continually in criminal activity uh, as a way to try to help um, reduce crime uh, in our communities. So uh, that ends my presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks for covering yes. all the enhanced supervision. Uh, I'll kind of take it from here. Before I go on, uh, I just want to make a reminder for the audience um, to go ahead, and if you have any sort of questions that come to mind, go ahead and put them in the chat, and uh, we'll compile those and, and save those for the end of the presentation. Um, before I go on with the slides, I'm actually going to skip back just a little bit and cover a little bit on research before we move on. So excuse my slight backtracking. 
Okay. And there's just a couple things I want to cover, but this kind of sets up some of the research that uh, Dr. Kim will present on here in, in just a couple of minutes as well. And one of the important things to remember about police probation pro partnerships is they have not been comprehensively or systematically evaluated. Um, they're generally classified as promising programs. So, for example, if you look at uh, OJJDP's program matrix, for example, on um, a National Gang Center, uh, you'll find that these kind of programs are typically regarded as promising programs. Uh, for example, the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership in Philadelphia, which is composed of an enhanced partnership. But looking back at some of the research that has attempted to evaluate partnerships, uh, Corbett made an attempt to quantify the Boston Nightlight Partnership's effectiveness. Uh, and he did that by trying to compare homicide trends in Boston pre and post nightlight using available homicide data. Now, just as a couple examples, uh, there were 93 homicides in 1993 as compared to 39 through November of 1997. Uh, the number of firearm-related assaults dropped from 799 in 1995 to 126 through November of 1997. Additionally, from 1995 to 97, there were no juvenile firearm-related homicides. Uh, this evidence, however, it fails to account for any sort of other extraneous variables that may have impacted those, those homicide trends. And we always have to keep in mind there are many initiatives uh, that are in operation, that were in operation, targeting at-risk youth, uh, even in, in Boston at that time. Uh, second, homicide rates dr have dramatically declined across the country over the past couple decades. Uh, and, and there's uh, some work by Rosenfeld um, and colleagues that kind of gives a good overview uh, of those, that issue and trying to tease out which programs have an effect when uh, in the larger scheme everything, the crime has been going down. Nonetheless, uh, the Nightlight program reportedly made over 6,000 contacts with gang affiliated probationers and the rate of curfew compliance of youth reportedly doubled to 70% from 90, 1990 to 1997 and keep in mind the, the formal Nightlight program started in 1992. Uh, there is an evaluation of the San Bernardino uh, Nightlight Partnership, and this is by Warrell and Gaines, uh, and they use some more rigorous methodology, uh, specifically they use time series and displacement diffusion analysis. Uh, overall, the results are somewhat inconclusive, but there is some interesting uh, findings. Uh, the program components with that program were similar to Boston's Nightlight, in verb curfew enforcement, joint patrols, and school contacts. The authors used arrest records rather than homicide data as a proxy to crime that they, they admittedly stated comes with some inherent limitations. In other words, um, you know, are crime records really analogous to actual crime trends? Um, so if you know a dark figure of crime that comes to mind. Nonetheless, their time series analysis showed a significant reduction in burglary, assault, and theft when comparing San Bernardino with Fontana. Um, though the methods were more rigorous, limitations of Corbett's study still kind of remain uh, this whole idea that, that crime rates have been going down all across the country during that time frame, and also what other variables out there may have impacted, what other intervention programs were going on, etc. Okay, I want to move on to, we went through some of the benefits, we talked about stalking horse, and I want to mention on the stalking horse, there's a, a good article, it's in the perspectives, it's in a past perspectives issue, and it's by Alderman, who's a jurist doctorate, and it summarizes these court cases related to um, searches of probationers by law enforcement. So if you're interested in that information, you want more information, feel free to send me an email, and I'll, I'll help get you in touch with the uh, that source. Moving along to, uh, there was one more issue I think we briefly mentioned, and it was this idea of organizational lag. Uh, organizational lag really is just in terms of bureaucracy. Um, as we know, as folks who've worked in, in state government or elsewhere will know, there's always a, a little bit of bureaucracy that you have to deal with, and it can get in the way of, of doing, uh, doing your job or, or making headway, particularly if you're trying to do something as uh, flexible as a partnership. 
And at this time, actually, I'd like to go ahead and pass the presentation over to Dr. Kim. She's going to discuss some of the research that's been conducted with partnerships in Texas. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, I want to share with you guys the research findings of 2007 survey of law enforcement agency, which is conducted by Correctional Management Institute of Texas and Texas Region Center for Policing Innovation. Uh, this study investigated the pattern of police community correction partnership in Texas and analyzed the experience, view of police chiefs, sheriff, participating in partnership with the probation, pro agency. So again, this study focused on two research questions. One is the pattern of police probation, pro partnership, and the second research question was how those police leaders feel their experience with working with probation or parole agency. Just this study was conducted in Texas. I want to give some information about projects spotlight in Texas. I think Tom Williams already mentioned some of the fact. In 1999, during Governor George Bush administration in Texas, they created Project Spotlight. This innovative program focused research on the prevention of crime in Texas neighborhood and created a working partnership between law enforcement and community correctional agencies. In addition to funding the seven counties to create a working partnership, the governor office created the Center for Project Spotlight at the Georgia Bureau Criminal Justice Center on the center of Sam Houston State University. The center was responsible for developing or delivering educational forums, specialized training, and on-site technical assistance. While efforts made to grow the partnership under the project spotlight, when Governor Bush resigned following his election as President of the United States and much of the program support departed as well. In 2003, funding for Project Spotlight was eliminated. However, in Texas, many practitioners still believe that the idea of partnership and collaboration between police and community correctional agents has taken root in many jurisdictions across Texas. Perrot and Snyder in 1999 in their report identified five types of the police correction partnership which include enhanced supervision, fugitive apprehension unit, information sharing partnership, specialized enforcement partnership, and interagency problem solving partnerships. In this study, for each of these five types of partnership, the police chief, sheriff, asked to indicate the degree of partnership with adult probation agency, adult parole agency, and juvenile probation agency by report whether their agency have former partnership, informal partnership, or no partnership. 
In this study, formal partnership refers to situations in which there are operational agreements, protocol, contract, and or something memo of understanding between organization. For this study, informal partnership referred to programs and initiative forged on relationship between personnel. This table shows the number of partnerships the law enforcement agency has with probation per agency varied. So as you see in this table, of 232 agencies, 92 agencies, a little bit less than 3% of law enforcement agency has no formal or no informal partnership. While about 60 percent, 140 agencies had former or informal partnerships. This table provides the breakdown of involvement in each partnership types with the three types of community correction agencies. The overwhelming majority of law enforcement agencies did not have enhanced supervision partnership or fugitive apprehension partnership with the community correctional agencies. In opposition, 73%, 57%, 71% of law enforcement agencies report a former or informal information sharing partnership with adult probation, adult pro, and juvenile probation agency. What we found here is most of the partnerships are informal. Only a few of law enforcement agencies reported formal partnership with community correctional agency. About 11% of law enforcement agencies indicate there are former partnership with adult probation agency for specialized enforcement. 7% report the former information sharing partnership with the juvenile probation agency. And 6% for specialized enforcement partnership with adult parole agency. As you indicated in this table, regardless of the type of partnership, the agency has more formal or informal partnership with adult probation agency, while they had least formal or informal partnership with adult parole agencies. Next, the relationship between various law enforcement agency characteristic and the likelihood that this characteristic predict partnership status with various community collection agency explored. The finding for adult probation partnership are reported in this table. The only variable law enforcement agencies statistically significantly relate to having partnership with adult probation agency was primary area law enforcement agency served. The research found agencies serve rural area most likely to have entered the former or informal partnership with adult probation agency. The finding for adult parole agency reported in this table, none of the characteristic of the law enforcement agency was significant in predicting partnership with adult parole agencies.
The finding for juvenile probation partnership are reported in this table. Local police department less likely to report either former or informal partnership than sheriff office. Then we ask the question, how does police chief, sheriff, report or feel the experience with working with probation for officers? Overall, we found the chiefs and sheriff positive in their assessment and that they believe the partnership as beneficial to their own organization. You see this table, police chief and sheriff believe the role of the various community collection agency as complementary to the role of the police. They felt comfortable working with them and they believe the information received as a result of the partnership as very helpful. And then they believe the partnership is an effective way to supervise offenders. However, law enforcement leaders did not view the partnership is an effective way to reduce crime in their areas. But I have to explain that, remember this study, the majority of the sample in this study had just the informal partnership, not formal partnership. Therefore, we need more future study to examine whether the real law enforcement leaders with the former partnership had the same experience. Their experience might be different from what we found in this study. Again, our study, most of the agency had just the informal partnership. So here is the research conclusion. Our study found the overwhelming majority of the partnership in Texas are informal. Even without formal programs, it seems that police probation pro partnership are in one form or another practically inevitable. However, it should be noted that in most instances, partnership in the past based on individual relationship and many informal in nature finally limited to just information sharing and thus usually they are often terminated when key actors retire or they are transferred or they are promoted. Before, as Tom Williams explained, what made the operation night light lasting for many years was that it went beyond the personal relationship and then it was the former partnership. Therefore, formalizing the informal working relationship between police officer and probation pro officer is really important to reduce the potential for negative consequence. Also, this current study found probation agency more likely to seek out partnership with the local law enforcement department than compared to the case for parole agency. It could be that difference in the level of local control between probation and parole department can explain this difference. In general, probation office are under local county control well as parole is under state level control. Both sheriff office 
and local law enforcement department to a local stakeholder rather than being oriented towards state level issues. Another possible explanation for the lack of police parole partnership can be found in a significant transformation in sentence and correction which emphasize greater proportionality and consistency in sentencing as a goal and rely on the use of incarceration for longer period. Here another research question, what we found in terms of the experience and view of police chiefs and sheriff who participated in partnership with probation parole agency. One positive finding of the current study is that police chief, sheriff generally tend to view partnership with community correction agency positively. This finding is inconsistent, inconsistent with the previous research finding on the negative experience of probation officer who participated in the partnership with police in Texas. Different picture on the partnership between law enforcement agency and community collection agency might result from law enforcement officer long experience with community oriented policing thereby more experience with other agencies. Law enforcement officer experience with community-oriented policing over the past decades have made them more comfortable to accept assistance from and work with other agencies. The positive evaluation of law enforcement leaders leave room for hope for expansion of such partnership in the future. Another possible explanation of this positive evaluation law enforcement leaders might be that the partnership themselves are geared more toward control and surveillance, which is traditionally associated with police activity. Again, this study only focused on law enforcement, probation, parole, partnership in Texas. Different jurisdictions, different, different partnership might have different research. Therefore, we need a future study on other type of police correction partnership in other jurisdictions. Now I want to pass to Adam. Adam?
Adam, there's a problem with the audio. We can't hear you. Okay. I think I got it. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, sorry about that. That's my fault. Um, just to pick up off of where Dr. Kim left off and then going on to the Care model, um, what I was talking about with the care model and the care framework is a report that Dr. D. Michelle and I had done uh, late last year and over the course of the year we put together uh, this model based on components very similar to the OJJDP comprehensive gang model and also the BJA SARA model which is scanning analysis reentry uh, response and assessment and in this model we have collaboration analysis reentry and evaluation uh, and the point being to make collaboration a key focus uh, of these kind of endeavors. And within this, you can kind of put it within this larger framework uh, and develop these general steps, uh, primarily identifying your partners, uh, defining the problem in terms of a needs assessment, developing the response, uh, putting that within a logic model, um, which documents the overall uh, project goals, etc. And then implementing the response in terms of maintaining fidelity, making sure that it is implemented as design, which is a, a very common problem with programs, particularly when you're trying to extrapolate a program from one jurisdiction into uh, another jurisdiction. Evaluating the response in terms of multiple types of evaluations, uh, both process and outcome. And the process helps determine uh, whether fidelity is established, whether the program truly is implemented as intended, whereas the outcome gives you those um, sort of bottom line figures. Uh, does it actually reduce crime? And also there's other evaluations such as cost-benefit analysis, which takes it a step further than just outcomes. Um, does it actually, if it has a small effect, does the cost outweigh uh, the benefit or vice versa? Um, is it worth the cost that it, it accrues? to keep doing that program or does it need to be changed uh, which is where we put in modify the response ideally the project would um, would evolve over time and this would have to happen with reevaluation so it's not enough just to do one evaluation but to continually reevaluate and then finally some policy practice recommendations and these are really meant uh, for criminology in general um, and I think several of the folks in the audience probably uh, agree with some of these, particularly number seven, as far as improving resource allocation for community corrections and, and really pull that from um, some of the articles in Criminology and Public Policy Journal by uh, Durloff and Najin who uh, discuss the need to put more resources into not only law enforcement, also put it into probation and parole. Um, formalizing partnerships is important in the sense that it you really can't evaluate a partnership that doesn't have some sort of formal component to it, that doesn't have sort of a uh, sense of uh, clear objectives that can be tracked. Also, defining the policies and legal parameters, this is in terms of the searches when law enforcement are participating with probation and parole officers, and then also if law enforcement are using probation and parole information to surveillance, for to do surveillance and to uh, observe probationers or parolees out in the community. Um, mission distortion has been a highly cited topic and obviously policies can be instituted to kind of help deal with that. And the number six I want to mention too in the sense that we talked about increased offender monitoring earlier. Um, part of making sure that it makes sense too to use these partnerships as who they're used for and, and typically we see them used with gang affiliated probationers or parolees and those are going to be your high risk folks and per the risk and these responsivity principles you don't want to use these sort of high surveillance type programs for low risk folks most likely you just increase their problems and there's actually an example of this I believe it's a Anchorage CAN program which stands for if I can Locate it. No, I don't. I don't know offhand what it stands for, but if if you're interested in that program, I can send you the article. But it's a program 
that was assigned increased supervision of youth, and what they found was it increased technical violations for youth across uh, those involved in the program, whereas otherwise they would not have uh, had those type of revo revocations. Here you can see all the, the slides, the, the slide for the, all the sources in PowerPoint uh, that have been in here. If you're interested in any of these, and I'll share, I can happy to share the PowerPoint with anyone if you want to shoot me an email. Um, I can help you locate any of these sources if they're of interest to you. And with that, uh, I want to talk about the APPA website. If you're not already a member for APPA, I encourage you to join. We have various resources on the website. We have periodical. Uh, we have our biannual institutes and trainings, so feel free to check out the website. And we'll, we'll move on to our question and answer session. And here on the slide also you'll find my contact info. If you need to email me for any, any sort of information, copy the slides, just feel free to let me know. And we will start doing some questions. And Ms. Williams and Dr. Kim, I've unmuted both of you so we can go through these questions together. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. The first question that we have here is, since it appears that most of these partnerships were formed and funded in the 90s, how many are still in existence? And for those no longer in existence, what is the reasons? And uh, Ms., you know, Mr. Williams, maybe you take first shot at that. Right. Um, a lot of the, um, the projects, as I indicated before, were actually started with BJA funding, and unfortunately, um, a lot of them were not continued. But as Dr. Kim mentioned, as well as myself, a lot of the uh, partnerships uh, became not formal but informal partnerships. Like, the, for example, if we use CSOSA as an example, it really didn't start with federal funding, but um, when we began the agency, we knew that having a relationship with uh, law enforcement was going to be important. Uh, and not only that, uh, we know based on um, our relationship with the community here in the District of Columbia that it was uh, important for us to establish a relationship with law enforcement. And as we have meetings on a regular basis, monthly, with the community, uh, we thought it would be fundamentally important to do that. That's why we engaged in an MOU. So a lot of the jurisdictions have either formalized it in the MOU, whereas uh, standard business, for example, we have a policy that speaks to our accountability tours. And as was mentioned before, uh, we use it on the high risk uh, grouping. So those persons who are assessed at intensive or max, maximum level supervision, then we have the partnership meeting where we discuss those issues with law enforcement. So we really see it uh, in collaboration with law enforcement as one of the things that we see as fundamentally important, important as adding value uh, to the community and value with regards to the partnerships. And it also increases the relationship between law enforcement and the preservation agency. Uh, as some, most of your callers are aware, you know, we used to be in a fortress type of situation with regards to preservation services. You know, we were market up in our offices, we didn't want to come out, people had to come see us, we were like centrally located and everybody had to come downtown to see us. Uh, and as we start getting more and more into the community, we started um, seating our offices in the communities where offenders live, uh, to give them closer access to us, closer access to the services, and they're in relationships uh, by and large to law enforcement uh, as well. So I can't give you the exact number of the ones that are actually are still in existence. Uh, from a formalized funding standpoint, for example, like Texas, uh, as I mentioned before, it started out as state-funded, uh, but then it became like an informal partnership. So they either um, are partnerships for which there's an MOU that kind of is the guiding principle between the two agencies, preservation as well as law enforcement, or uh, because of relationships that are formed between chiefs respectively our preservation agencies and uh, police departments, uh, they have continued the relationship, uh, recognizing that it's a mutual benefit for both. Okay, great. Dr. Kim, do you want to add at all to that? Uh, I think as Tom Williams explained, the first one 
really funding is important. Second one is what we found from the perspective from the law enforcement is really those readers, police chief or the sheriff, their idea about how they feel about working with the those corrections agency is important. So I think awareness about the working with those interagency is really key factor to can formalize the partnership between law enforcement and corrections agencies. Yeah, and I think uh, I would agree with both of you on both of those, uh, both the funding and then the, the buy-in from the top. And it does seem like a lot of the programs maybe may have started with weed and seed or something like that. They got some funding to get started. And then um, perhaps once the funding goes away, whether or not they continue to do these sort of partnerships is contingent on that leadership buy-in. Um, moving on to sort of the next question. Um, and I think this is another question for uh, Mr. Williams as well, uh, specifically. It says, do the probation officers that go out with police go through any special police training or just the training given to them when they become probation officers? That's a good question. Uh, no, we don't have uh, special uh, police training. Um, but here's the, the important thing about the relationship that we have with the uh, Metropolitan Police Department here. Uh, our staff go through an academy, naturally, uh, with regards to their training. Uh, we don't carry weapons. We're not authorized to carry weapons. But uh, we have uh, a real good working relationship with law enforcement. So. The officer who's going out with uh, our community supervision officer, uh, they get uh, to know who that person is because they normally go out all the time. So we are assigned an officer to go out with us. Uh, the other important thing from the Metropolitan Police Department's commitment to us that they ensure that that officer is basically taken off call during the time they, they with accountability towards with us. So. If a call comes in, they don't have to rush to that call, not unless it's an extreme emergency. But they don't, uh, they don't be doing two different activities, going out with us to make our home contacts and then responding to uh, police calls as well. So because we know who the offices are, are and we meet with them you know, once a week at our uh, information sharing sessions, we get to know who the offices are and uh, personally, and we also get uh, a bit of information from them on terms of you know what to do. There's always a routine of if something happens, here's what you need to do, uh, and here's what I'm going to do. So we kind of hear that right off front. Uh, give an example. Sometimes we're going to the home, and like I mentioned before, uh, there's contraband in the area. So our staff are trained that once uh, we notice that, we are to kind of step back and let the police officer you know does do what they actually get trained to do. So they'll secure the area, secure how many members are in the family, uh, get everybody in one location so they can you know, keep an eye on them. Uh, and then they will engage in what they need to do to either secure the contraband uh, and also to, also to call, call back up. We've had several occasions where we found weapons or, or drugs in the home when we went on our accountability tour. Uh, and our officer did you know, just that. They kind of moved away, moved themselves to the back side of, of the area, the room. Uh, backup was called, the area was secure, and then they conducted their investigation. Um, but our officers are not trained to um, uh, engage an offender in any kind of altercation or assist a police officer if the you know, fight breaks out or something like that. So we, know, we have to leave that to the trained law enforcement personnel to do that. Okay, great. Um, there's a couple questions actually that were referring to the stalking horse incidents, and I think I'll take first stab at this and then uh, let each of you kind of follow um, suit. But the, the question is, can you expand on stalking horse incidents? Um, this is a lot of time spent on inf information sharing, uh, but what are limitations? And then also uh, an individual asked, what was the Supreme Court case for police using search policy on parolee or probationer? And the cases that we cited earlier were U.S. v. Knights 2001, but there are also uh, several other cases uh, in there as well. And if anyone's interested in that, um, I, I can provide the articles and references to those cases for folks. But basically what the Starting Horse Incident gets at is uh, the police using probation and parole as a conduit or a means to enter the probationer or parolee's home. 
uh, and do searches and also to basically harass the offenders because they know who they are uh, and they can you know, drive around the street and basically bother them. Um, so the question is sort of what's the line there and what's going too far. Now the searches of probationers and parolees by police uh, is obviously limited, um, but the case U.S. Unites, the, the, the real sort of underlying theme with that case was that in the conditions of that individual's uh, release, it stated that they were subject to searches of their person and their home by not just probation and parole officers, but also law enforcement officers. So it explicitly stated that in their conditions of release. Um, and that was a California case. Uh, if you look at different states, you're probably going to find different things. I'm going to, I'm going to take a, I'm going to say that most likely you're not going to see that in the conditions in other states typically. Right. Um, but that was sort of the issue around that particular case. And that's why that was upheld was because of that condition having that explicit, explicitly written in there. Um, I don't know, Mr. Williams, Dr. Kim, yeah, you I agree with yeah. you. Um, this was an, un I won't say, and I shouldn't say unusual order, but it's one that uh, we're not used to because it did indicate that there was a um, search of the person, the property, the residence, the vehicle, uh, any effects that he had, and also it was so wide open that it says search at any time. Uh, in addition to that, as you mentioned, as I mentioned, the law enforcement personnel was also included in the order. Now the, the interesting thing about this interesting thing about this case is, as, as I mentioned, was the power company um, had actually turned off this gentleman's um, yeah. power, uh, and because um, there was a fire at, um, I think it was like a substation, if I remember correctly, uh, there was a fire at the substation, and they attributed that this fire was in close proximity to turn off this person's um, electric gas electric. Uh, a detective was assigned to the case, and, it, uh, and the detective knew of this gentleman and knew the conditions. Uh, and uh, they kind of staked out his house. Uh, they saw a friend who was actually uh, coming in and out of the house. Uh, they suspected that the friend had uh, some kind of contraband or weapons or pipe bombs within his vehicle, and, and that he was kind of related to, these two were kind of related to this incident that happened with regards to this fire that happened at this substation. Uh, and as a result of knowing of this condition, uh, then the detective went into the home and then says, basically, I know you got this condition and conducted the search. So then you got a crime that was being committed, and then an investigation, and then a search. As most of your listeners know, you need a warrant to do something like that. Yeah. But because of special condition included the uh, law enforcement, the Supreme Court had upheld that. But ordinarily, uh, and I'm not an attorney, something like that would not... Uh, uh, certainly, if challenged, w w the government probably would have lost that case if not for that that special condition. But as you mentioned, um, and it's similar to here in the district where where we do have law enforcement going into the homes with us, uh, you know, staff are trained that you know, law enforcement can't use uh, their ability to come into the home with us to c uh, conduct warrantless searches. Uh, for an example, if I can stand on that that conversation. Normally when we go into the home during accountability tours, we go and, and deter, ask the person to, to let us go into the area where they live, where they uh, sleep rather, and then we look for articles of clothing that belong to them, uh, shoes under the bed, you know, that type of thing. But we do not pull out drawers, not unless they give us uh, desk, their uh, bureau drawers, that is. We do not pull those articles open. Well, um, or open a closet doors without first getting permission, you know, for that person to do that. As opposed to law enforcement saying, okay, well, let's go up and see where you sleep and start looking under the bed and things like that. So that's, that's the main difference. Great. And we're, we're kind of almost, uh, time we got like a minute left, so I'm going to squeeze one more question in. And uh, this one's for Dr. Kim. And the individual asked, it, it was noted that approximately 292 surveys were received for the Texas research. How many surveys were mailed? So it sounds they want to know about the response rate. Okay, actually, uh, at that time, 2007, we sent out all shape office, and then there are about 1,000 local police department. So we sent out all shape office and then random sample of police department in Texas. Our response rate was about 45%. So I think it is enough to conduct research and analyze research, but still there are 55% of research was not responding.
However, we tested whether there is the, any difference between the department or local law enforcement department or sheriff who respond or who not respond to no different significant difference between those two groups. Again, 45% okay. are enough to analyze the data, but still limited. It's half of the law enforcement that we have no idea what they think and what okay. kind of the partners about, they have. Yeah, just a few seconds, so, um, and then we're uh, pretty much at the end of our webinar, so we used up all our time. Uh, I appreciate everyone who attended the webinar, and I uh, thank the presenters, Dr. Kim, Mr. Williams, for both uh, joining us today, and I, I hope everyone has a good, a good Monday. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye.